it's not too often that this happens when I'm reading Tozer. I see it somewhat in my Lustre's Highest, but every work of compilation, like say this, sometimes is a what we call an aggregate. An aggregate is taking different compounds and putting them together to create something stronger in its combined form than what it was separately with the pieces outside of it. And sometimes in books, people will take the writings of some author and take excerpts of it that appear to be similar or somehow fit and then they'll cut it up and put it into, you know, collections, which like this is a collection, a daily devotional. And um, it'll seem to make sense at the time, or sometimes it just doesn't go for it. In this one, I'm just going to read today's Tozer and then comment on it because obviously in what's being shared, Tozer is referring to something that occurred in his day, which wasn't that far, that long ago. It was in our century. And uh, he knows what he's talking about, but unfortunately, the commentary needed the rest of the sermon to make sense of what he's talking about. <laughs> and it's not there, so we'll just go with what we normally do in commentary on what God inspires us to say. Jesus asks us to love the unlovely. No man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. 1 John 4.12 In his earthly ministry, our Lord Jesus loved babies, publicans, harlots, and sick people. And he loved them spontaneously and individually. The person who claims to follow Jesus cannot afford to do otherwise. A peril always confronting the ministers is that he may come unconsciously to love religious and philosophic ideas rather than saints and sinners. It is altogether possible to feel for the world of lost men the same kind of detached affection that the naturalist Fabre say felt for a hive of bees or a hill of black ants. They are something to study, to learn from possibly, even to help, but nothing to weep over or to die for. Where this attitude prevails is often, soon often leads to a stilted and pedantic kind of preaching. The minister assumes that his hearers are as familiar with history, philosophy, and theology as he is, and so indulges in a learned allusions and makes casual references to books and writers wholly unknown to the majority of people who listen to him and mistakes the puzzled expressions on the faces of his parishioners for admiration of his brilliance. Why religious people continue to put up this sort of thing, as well as to pay for it and support it, is beyond me. I can only add it to the long list of things I do not and probably never will understand. You know, I, I like what he says, because you know, I kind of get it. You know, there's there's a lot of material out there for the for ministers and preachers and pastors and elders and deacons to use, like pulpit commentary, or they'll even pull a book like Tozer and use a quote from it. There's even a format nowadays, you know, for expositional teaching that you give, you know, a dissertation of, you know, reading through the scripture. Then you go back through and you identify certain passages and what it points to and how it fits historically in the scripture as well as in the Bible of the book. Then you make a personal application to it. Then you, you know, and you, you, can, you get the idea. It just goes on and on. And, you know, it's a nice idea, but it's not what Jesus said. <laughs> Jesus said, hey, look, if they're going to bring you before magistrates, I mean, come on now, people are like magistrates. If they're going to bring you before magistrates and elders and deacons, whatever. Don't worry about what you're going to say because at the time that you say it, the Holy Spirit will give you the words that you need to say. And Frankly, that's what I do. Maybe I look stupid. I'm not sure. But I think, you know, that there's a certain cohesiveness to the presentation of the material that I've been giving that so far in what I've been doing in presenting the Word of God in the Open Bible and in Hebrews Explained and in I'm trying to think of the other video that I'm doing um, uh, about just straight scripture and sharing the Word of God. Um, Open Bible, Hebrews Explained, 
And I think one other one, but I can't even think of what it is right now. <laughs> That's funny. I don't do that many recordings, do I? Oh, well. But the point being is that I don't think about it. I don't need to. I mean, my normal day is filled with, you know, studies and scriptures and things going on and things being done and God working this and God showing me that and, you know, going through the normal routines. And when it comes time to teach, it just comes out what's already in there because God has already put it there. I mean, it isn't like I sit down to plan out all these, you know, different dissertations or explanations or qualifications of the scripture that God has so arranged and put in front of me that is obvious to anyone else who wants to read it. I mean, it says right on the title where it came from. But I think Tozer was trying to say that a lot of men sometimes don't care enough about you, the viewer, the person who's watching, the person who's listening, the person who's trying to get a handle on what you're saying, and that they don't love enough like Jesus did, to make it personal to the person, the reality of what that person who's watching, listening, or hearing needs, wants, or would have applied to his life, had that person in front of them who's sharing the Word of God been a little more real about what they were saying. And it's real easy to be, you know, so theologically minded that you're no spiritually good. Hey, that sounds like a new quote. Give it to me credit. <laughs> God did it. But yeah, I mean, come on. Don't you see that at times that sometimes some of these guys sound so theologically minded that they are no spiritually good? Or even worse, they're so spiritually minded they're no personally good. <laughs> In other words, they get so spiritual about so spiritual things that personally it goes right over your head and it has no personal contact with you it doesn't connect the dots for you it doesn't make you feel like you're being spoken to I know I've run into that maybe you have but another point that Tozer made at the beginning was love loving the publicans loving the sinners loving the child molester did it say child molester? Loving the New Agers. Do I have to love the New Agers? Loving the pole dancers that, because of the economy, women are being forced into dancing for a living. At least to make some money till they can earn a living. Is that what he's talking about? Loving even those who have fallen in the ministry. Really? Yeah, I thought we would just condemn them to hell and walk away from them. Loving someone like you and me. Because you see, I'm not anybody special. You leave me alone for five. <laughs> my favorite expression. <laughs> it is one. Sorry, Lord, but it's so true and you and I know it. But you leave me alone five minutes, and I'm flying into sin. <laughs> I mean, come on, let's be real, folks. You know, given temptation, given the right situation, oh yeah, dive right in. <laughs> sin, oh boy. <laughs> and you jump right in. But at some point in time, you go, Sin, oh, I look so good. Man, those consequences really are starting to wear on me. It's you know, it's really starting to hurt more than it than it's worth feeling good for a little while. Because man, sin is fun to start with, you know. <laughs> but boy, after a while, you know what? It seems to catch up with you. Bam, man, when those consequences hit. Oh boy. Kinda like taking the credit card and going out and charging everything, but finding out what the bill is at the end of the month. Or finding out that you don't have a credit card because you overcharged. Well, I hope you don't overcharge Grace. But you see, we who are spiritual ought to bear one another's burdens. So if we are knowledgeable of the Word of God, then we know that Jesus took upon himself the sins of the common people. He took upon himself your sin. He took my sin. And you know, he didn't beat me up for it either.
when I read what Jesus did, the thing I see is that he allowed everyone to come unto him. Didn't matter what their initial motivation was. He answered straight to the heart and got to the heart of the matter. Maybe they didn't accept what he had to say and walked away. But they had the chance and the opportunity. And it didn't mean he didn't love them any less. As a matter of fact, it says he greatly loved that one man. Think about this. The one man who goes away from him and walks away sorrowful because he could not give up his riches, Jesus loved. Do you hate child molesters? Or do you hate the sin? Is the person caught up in a personal choice? Or are they caught up in a addiction to the flesh, the lust of the flesh? the lust of the eye, the pride of life. Does the child molester need to be saved? Does the child molester need Jesus? Would you condemn a child molester to eternal punishment forever and ever and ever and ever? Torment day after day after day for eternity? Would you take a terrorist and torture them every single day after they've given you the information you want? After you know he has no more information? Would you torture him day after day after day after day? God's love grieves for the reality of the fact that mankind has salvation available to them and chooses not to follow through with what God has provided in his son's death and resurrection. God himself grieves over the very fact that man will not accept his yoke upon him. Being easy and the burden light will not accept the salvation that God has provided in his love in his mercy, in his kindness. If God grieves, and God loves to such a degree, and God cares so much for the world he gave his only son, is there anyone not worthy of salvation? Or better yet, who do you think is worthy of salvation. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. For we are like sheep. We have all gone astray. And every man has gone his own way. And he has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. Who would you deny salvation to? Well, who would you condemn to eternal, continuing torment? The answer is someone. You've got the wrong answer. Because as far as God is concerned, no one should go. No one was meant to be damned eternally. The only ones that were damned for eternity were the angels who rebelled. Man was never intended to go there. And man still is not designed or planned out or even made for eternal damnation and torment. For hell must be enlarged in order to receive those who have rejected God's plan for salvation that he has for every single man, woman, and child.
who would you send to hell? The answer is no one.